Um, so uh, I'll start by explaining um, about our organization, uh, the First Peoples Cultural Council. Uh, we, as Stephanie mentioned, we're a crown agency uh, established in 1990. Um, we're actually backed by a mandate by legislation to re revitalize uh, heritage, language, and culture in BC, uh, which is an extremely unique um, position to be in actually worldwide. There are many, many countries that are an indigenous people around the world that are trying to get just to the point of the legislation. So it's great to be in that position where our work is backed by legislation. Um, we provide mostly funding for arts, language, uh, First Voices programs, which is our technology programs. Um, and we work directly with communities uh, on, on funding and on projects. Um, we're also led an indigenous led organization. So we have a board of directors um, that is indigenous and part of our um, way of operating is being very close to um, what communities need. Uh, so that's kind of embedded in our work. Uh, we also develop resources and materials, which we'll show two of them today, like the maps and first voices. Uh, we provide training and support to communities, whether it's for arts, language, technology. Um, and we also do a lot of advocacy for First Nations languages, arts, and culture. Um, a lot of it is in BC because BC is fairly advanced. Um, with some of these things, we get a lot of also international connections every now and then. Um, in terms of who we serve, um, I highly, highly encourage you to also go to fpcc.ca and learn a little bit about the, the land we're on and the languages. It's an extremely diverse um, language kind of hotspot that we're on. We have 204 uh, communities. Uh, 34 BC languages, um, and we serve uh, all of them. Uh, we also, so in terms of our kind of audiences, we serve First Nations communities, but also individuals. Um, so for example, in some cases we work with a nation, in some cases an individual artist may apply to an individual grant. Um, we work with all First Nations and other Indigenous people and in Inuit uh, in urban areas in BC, and of course, artists, art organizations, uh, language champions, and more. Um, when we kind of like look at the scope of our stuff, we we find that almost anyone who has anything to do with this, we we will work with them at some point. So sometimes it's other organizations working with indigenous people, or um, like the First Nations Technology Council. So pretty wide uh, scope. Uh, yeah, so that's, I thought I'd give a quick introduction to that. And um, with that, I will pass it on to uh, Hannah to talk about the map. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Tansi, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Hannah Michon. I am a communications officer at First Peoples Cultural Council and also sit on the First Peoples Map Committee. I am Cree with relations to Satellite Cree Nation in Alberta with mixed European ancestry. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm zooming in this afternoon from my home on the territories of the Kwangan speaking peoples known today as the Esquimalt, Songhees and Wasanich First Nations. I have been an uninvited guest on these territories for the last 18 years and would like to thank the original caretakers uh, for allowing me to live and work and connect to this beautiful territory each and every day. So I'm super excited to share the First Peoples map with you today. This project has been in the works for quite some time now, so it's my pleasure to share with you the latest map that we launched in June this year. All right, so for those that are not familiar with the map, it is an interactive online map featuring information about Indigenous languages, arts and cultural heritage in BC. There's no other map that integrates these facets um, that are documented in indigenous languages, arts and cultural information that's user generated content, um, including recordings and videos and audio and images. 
So FECC developed the First Peoples Map uh, in response to First Nations communities. So it was the communities that really wanted a central platform to share information about their diverse languages, arts, and cultural heritage and communities. So this map was then created in collaboration with these First Nations communities, as well as Indigenous artists, language champions, elders, knowledge keepers, and cultural workers. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, um, we launched the newest version of the map back in June, um, but the map as you see it today has previously gone through some rigorous changes over the last 16 years. It has overgone, undergone uh, years of research and data collection, working with communities, consultations, workshops, interviews, um, and then of course lots of work on the design and development to get to um, where it is today. So the original language map was created in 2005. Uh, this was with funding from the BC Ministry of Education, started by the linguist Sarah Kell, uh, with the contemporary language group boundaries um, that was provided by the Museum, Anth Museum of Anthropology at UBC. So from that language boundaries, adjustments were made uh, based on the best available knowledge um, of language spoken by First Nations uh, affiliated with land reserves. Uh, so it wasn't until 2008 uh, that a former FECC employee, Alex Wadsworth, led the expansion of this online map into a website with more content uh, featuring languages, nations, and communities. Um, and this co content was um, supported by a short series of interviews with fluent speakers uh, from around the province. So again, a lot of the consultation work and interviews with communities to really enhance um, those language boundaries. Um, on our language map, there is the language and dialect names that you see, and those are based on research that has been done by First Peoples Cultural Council. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, FECC develops a lot of research and resources, and one of those is the status of First Nations languages. Uh, this report is done every four years, and so our next report is actually coming up, and we'll be updating the information with the new data results in 2022. Uh, so around when the language map was uh, beginning, there was also a separate arts map that was in uh, production. So Kathy Charles Wary, who was the former arts program manager at the time, now is our special advisor, spearheaded the development um, of this separate arts map. And this map was related to a desire to focus on Indigenous artists' strengths and the resources that they draw on and the importance of connecting to place. So for artists, resources are crucial to artistic vitality, um, like materials from the land, there's mentors, studios, galleries, events, and financial resources. Uh, the arts map was a way to build relationships to community. Um, and so that was celebrated through this arts map. Um, lots of work as well was done with communities in terms of consultation. Um, a lot of mapping, cultural mapping workshops were done, interviews, and of course the actual design and development uh, and testing. So it was really also with the arts map that every detail um, was done through some consultation work. So even the little icons that are used on the map um, came about through one of the, the workshops that they had done with communities. So in 2012, they had their official launch of the First Peoples Map and or the arts map, and since then, um, is provided an online space where Indigenous artists and groups and organizations can really put themselves uh, on the map and gain visibility for their practices, either as artists or performers, musicians, uh, storytellers, and media artists. So in 2019, uh, once we heard from communities that they wanted this centralized platform, uh, FPCC was driven to create a more robust, um, integrated platform with more data points and improved enhanced functionality and better interface and um, better mobile compatibility and um, uh, a site that would better support the user generated contributions. So um, one year later, we decided to add a new layer to the map um, it was the grants layer. And this layer is integrated in the map to show all of the 
uh, language, arts, and heritage grants that are offered through FPCC uh, across the province in the last five years. Um, and then that brings us to 2021. So uh, we are proud to have launched the map on June 15th, uh, 2021, coinciding with uh, Indigenous History Month and leading up to Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. <laughs> so today the map now contains the 34 First Nations languages to what is now called British Columbia. It has the 204 First Nations communities. It has 259 artists, it has over 600 uploaded artworks, it has recordings and pronunciations and greetings and language stats, um, over 81 cultural centers, galleries and indigenous organizations, and over 300 points of interest on our new heritage layer. So there's lots of information that's been added on the map and it continues to grow each, each day. <clears throat> so this map is important for Indigenous people to feel empowered, uh, to upload their own information and their knowledge and to share their voice. Um, the map is a place for them to include themselves on the map as content experts. Uh, I feel it's really important to have a safe space where Indigenous people can really see themselves represented on the map, uh, whereas they may not be represented on other conventional maps. Um, also, being able to speak one's language, the ability uh, to protect and revitalize Indigenous languages, arts and cultural heritage, our human rights recognized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and supported by the calls to action in the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. The First Peoples Map is unique uh, in that the content is from community experts who are deeply invested in the work of linguistic and artistic and cultural survival um, and new content is regularly added. So this map is a living document, uh, as I mentioned, and FPCC adds information about grants every year and updates the status of First Nations languages in BC every four years. So artists and cultural heritage experts can actually add content and upload their work at any time. Um, and FPCC is also working with some of our current uh, grant recipients uh, to encourage them to share some of their work on the map as well. Um, so who can use the map? The map is a resource for everyone. Um, it helps non-Indigenous people to better appreciate Indigenous perspectives. Um, the map supports a growing interest amongst Canadians to learn more about Indigenous peoples and how to honour their Indigenous cultures, languages and Indigenous perspectives. It can be used by British Columbians and educators, people who are working with Indigenous communities, um, with or in community. Um, the map helps people to hear greetings and place names and find local artists, public art and cultural centres. And of course, we invite visitors as well to explore the map and learn a bit more about the land and the diverse cultures that we have here. So um, there's a few examples of people that um, we have been informed of that are using the map already. And I just wanna share some of them with you as I thought they're pretty um, interesting. A non-Indigenous nurse up in Prince George has used our map to learn more about the communities and the clients that she's serving. So she finds it helpful to search for common names and then seeing the surrounding communities. And she also uses the pronunciation feature to learn how to pronunciate the community or pronounce the community name that she's uh, working with. So I thought that was really awesome that she's doing that, um, that work. Um, also, we've had BC Wildfire show interest in the heritage layer specifically um, so that they can identify places of cultural importance and ensure that they are protected in case of an emergency. And then of course you have indigenous artists that are using the map. So uh, Niska artist, Carrie Morgan um, from Northwest BC, she uses the map to share her work and connect with other artists and feels it um, gives people a better understanding of sort of where her community is um, geographically on the map. So lots of people are using it for different reasons. And um, I think that's really kind of exciting to see that it can just be you know, used by everyone. All right, so that's kind of enough talking about the map. So let's let's see the map. All right, so 
hopefully everyone can see here. I'm just going to jump back this page here. So if you're a first time user visiting the map, it's um, maps.fpcc.ca and you'll be presented with this splash screen. And this is just kind of a prompt for first time visitors that you can click any of these buttons and it will prompt to the, the layer that you're searching for. So um, we will just click on languages. It doesn't really matter which one you click because once you're in the map, you can still click uh, between the layers. They work quite fluid with each other so that you're not like stuck on one layer. So first time, look at the map, super colorful, really interactive, lots to see, lots to explore, and there's lots of ways to do that. So um, this on the language layer, you can see all of the different colors for the language boundaries. Um, and then, of course, on the side, we have all of the different languages as well that you can kind of scroll through. So simply just by clicking somewhere on the map, you can click a language area and it will zoom right into that map space and it will provide information on the left hand side here. So for this language, you can learn how to pronounce it. I'm going to click this and hopefully everyone can hear it. Okay, Daniel's giving me a, a head nod, that's good. <laughs> and uh, a greeting. And then there's also a button for learn language and that's going to send you over to the First Voices language site. Um, you can also click to follow this language. So if there's any additional data points that are updated within this language, you'll get prompted with that information. Below that, you'll have information about the language. This information, as I mentioned before, is pulled from the, um, the status of First, Na First Nations Languages Report. Um, this hasn't been updated since 2018, so we will be updating that uh, next year. Uh, on the side here, you can see these little bubbles. This will just show you an example of all of the data points are, are within that language region. So you can see that there's 16 communities, organizations, artists, public arts, grants, etc. cetera. Um, those you can click on to, uh, I guess, look at them more, or you can just scroll through this um, bar on the side. So lots of ways to kind of access that information. If you're interested in a particular community, you can simply click the community and it will also zoom into that area more specifically. Again, it will give you a pronunciation recording, so we can click that. It's a bit low, but it does play if you go does, to the site. Okay. So. Um, and again, just some additional information. Um, if you're wanting to get in contact with the community, some of them have had their email address or like a band admin address or something on there, so you can, can reach out to them. And again, just some of the grants that have been um, awarded in that area. So there's lots of little bits to explore um, on these maps. I definitely suggest people um, kind of unpack some of that and explore it on your, your own time. There's lots you can learn about the communities. So I invite people to maybe explore a new community, learn something and, and kind of see where that goes. So next, I'm going to show you the arts layer. This one's my favorite layer. I like this one because it's just got lots of beautiful artwork to scroll through. So um, we'll get into that. Um, as you can see in the arts layer, uh, you'll notice that there's a bunch of artwork populated on the left hand side. This is going to be artwork that has been most recently added to our map. Um, this is kind of a win win. So whenever you go to the map, you can see if there's new artwork, but also for the artists that upload their work, this is a way for them to kind of highlight their work that they've uh, produced. So there's a number of ways to explore the arts layer. Um, again, you can just start clicking through some of these uh, artworks on the side. Um, I'm going to pick on James because his is right there. So you can click James. It will do a bunch of things at that point. It'll zoom the map into where he's located. So it looks like he's located in Burnaby over here. It'll pull up um, his artwork and then also a bio. So you can read more about James and also you can see if he's interested in commercial inquiry in case you wanted to um, reach out. So once you click his portfolio, you can see that the other artwork populates and you can kind of click through and explore that. So that's always super fun to do. 
Uh, one of the other features is you can explore through tags. So if you were looking for like a carver, you would click artist and then you can click these subcategories. So then you would click artist, visual, carver, and then these names will populate on the left hand side. So you can click to close and then you can click one of these guys, Bo Wagner, and it will um, show you where Bo is located. And then again, pull up his bio and his portfolio. So you can again kind of click through there. So that is one way if you wanted to specifically look for keywords uh, or tags, sorry. The other one is keywords. So if you actually know the name of the artist, so um, previously I mentioned Carrie Morgan, so we can uh, look her up here. Carrie Morgan, there you are. Uh, and again, so it, it uh, draws you into the map where they're located geographically to the land, it shows their artwork in the bio. So there's lots of ways you can explore um, with those features. Otherwise, you can just scroll right into the map. Um, any of these icons with the little face on it, those will be artists, so you can just kind of zoom around and explore. So there's lots of lots of fun things you can do there. I also have a couple different layers that you can toggle on and off if you're interested in the grants, uh, like a satellite view if you want to see more of the land, um, reserves, sleeping languages, and common names. So there's those you can kind of play around with as well. Um, last but not least, the heritage layer. Um, this is the newest layer and uh, newest addition to the map. There was no previous heritage map uh, before this, but there was definitely a need for it. So this map currently has over 300 points of interest. Uh, they could be cultural spaces, um, land place names, uh, fishing sites, rivers. Um, it's kind of open to communities on what they want to share. So. Um, one community I'll show that in particular that has done a lot of work is in the Lilawant Nation area. They have got a lot of these little points of interest here and so you can click those and um, it will populate with their description. Some of them might have imagery or a video. Um, so those are fun just to kind of poke around and, and learn something about the, the area. Um, in terms of how the information is uploaded, um, a lot of the information is um, contributed by communities and they'll have either like a language expert or a cultural heritage expert um, that kind of verifies those points of interest and will add those to the map. Um, it's like that one had a pronunciation too, so that's another fun feature is just learning um, these different place names and how they're pronounced and um, just giving them um, and their original meaning to them. Um, so before I finish, I also just want to mention that on the top layer or the menu banner here, we have um, more information um, how to use and about, but also a little link to a territorial acknowledgement document that uh, FECC has created. So this just links over to our resource library. Um, and this document we created as sort of like a guide. It's not necessarily like a one and done kind of thing. It's it's um, to lead people in sort of direction of how to um, start their territory acknowledgements or where to where to go for resources and support. So we have that on our map as well. I just want to share that one quickly. Um, so yeah, that's kind of about it for the map. Again, I just encourage people to explore and poke around and just see all the different information and artists and language that's on the map. So uh, yeah, thanks again for listening. I will hand it over to Daniel. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, much, Hannah. It's like amazing. I've, I know about these things and I've worked on them and I have listened to you present and I'm like excited again to go to maps.fpcc.ca. So I'm guessing that's a good sign. Um, I will say it's also kind of a lot of our projects are living projects. We actively develop them. So as you're exploring, if you find that there is something you think, if you have a great idea or if there is an issue or a bug or anything, like please reach out to us and, and let us know. Um, pretty much everything is under active development. And check back again because we constantly, like Hannah was saying, we, we update data, communities update data. 
Um, yeah, so I will um, move now into um, an explanation of first voices. Okay, so we talked a bit about uh, who we serve. We talked about the map. Uh, let's talk about first voices. So first voices. Danielle, we can't hear you. I could hear you, Daniel. Yeah, I can hear oh, you. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Daniel. It's my. It looks like I've got some network issues. So. Okay. It may Something have just happens. Been you. <laughs> you know what's going on on my. Yeah, end. it's okay. I'll reorient myself. Um, some some window management here. Okay, so we can talk about first voices now. So first voices is our um, language um, platform. It's a language revitalization platform um, developed um, by FPCC. Uh, it is developed in BC. Uh, it is meant primarily for um, indigenous communities, but also for a wider audience. And it is also unique in the world. Um, and part of like kind of the core value that we have with First Voices is working really close with communities, similarly to the map, um, where all the content and all the data is owned by communities and uploaded and managed by communities. Um, it was created in 2003, um, came out of the Husseinich community, um, kind of the brainchild of uh, uh, Jacinten. Uh, Dr. John Elliott and Peter Brand, who are in this amazing photo, um, probably roughly around the time they were thinking of this concept of taking the Senchothan language online, um, which was an incredible, innovative uh, idea. And they really pushed kind of the um, limits of what was available at the time and sparked the idea for other communities as well. Um, as, as I mentioned, it's a unique technology platform uh, where communities manage, share, and curate their language and cultural data. Uh, and if we fast forward uh, two decades, it's now a thriving online space um, that grew from one community to over 60 in BC. Uh, and also we have some users um, from around the world and across borders as well. Um, to give you a quick intro to our team, our development team is in-house and we have Guy, Rob, Bridget, uh, Clarissa and myself. Uh, we're a very cross-functional team, so we have um, various skill sets, uh, not just developers. We have linguists, we have people who are great at like, community work and we kind of work together to get this uh, service and maintain the service. Uh, we collaborate a lot with uh, Ben and Kira who are on our language team. Uh, and soon we'll be hopefully growing with uh, another full stack developer and a QA lead. So we're constantly trying to push the envelope with this service. In terms of the tools we provide, um, we're primarily web-based. Um, so we provide First Voices as a platform where indigenous uh, communities can log in and actually edit words and add words and manage these dictionaries, which I'll be showing you soon. Um, also like add songs and stories, manage their alphabet, which is a really, really big part of it, uh, especially given the, the language diversity that we have in BC. Um, they have auto-generated games that are generated from the content. Uh, they upload photo galleries, and we also have a auto-generated kids section. So the idea basically is like communities will capture this knowledge and digitize it and upload it, and then they can use it for language learning, they could use it for resource uh, development, they could use it for future generations. So it's been very helpful in the last 20 years since it's been conceived at, at, these, um, at reaching these goals. Um, we also have iOS and Android apps, so people could take this data uh, on the go. And we also uh, work on keyboards so that people can write in their language 
uh, which is extremely important for accessibility and being able to, to express your language and document it. Uh, we currently have 80 plus language sites managed uh, again by communities. They are constantly updating, adding content, etc. Communities can customize their site, manage privacy, and obviously collaborate on adding new entries. And all our work is, as I've mentioned, a community development approach. So we try to generate accessible materials, uh, support the process of, of working on this. We, we provide ongoing technical support um, and just do lots and lots of work to make sure that teams are successful. So what we'll do is I'll um, kind of give you a quick introduction to First Voices and we could browse it together so you could see um, what's on the site. So let's jump into that. Okay. Someone give me a thumbs up if you could see my screen. Or any indication. Yep, we got it. All right, that sounds like Bridget. Thank you. Um, nope. Okay, so um, again, I encourage you to go to firstvoices.com and go exploring. Uh, so what you'd see as a guest um, is kind of our homepage. Uh, we have the menu on the side that has some resources, some apps, the kids section. But really, um, probably the first thing you would want to do is jump uh, to explore languages. And here is where you could see the various language sites uh, that we have. Each of these represents a specific language site, which could be a, an entire language. It could be a variant or a dialect. dialect. It could be a community effort. Um, but within them, you will see kind of a description and a logo and some links that could give you uh, an idea of that specific site and initiative. Um, we could go, for example, to this one, and you will see a lot of these are aimed at primarily at um, the communities who are interested in learning and speaking and revital revitalizing the language, but everything you can see as a guest is also meant for non-Indigenous people allies, etc. So you can read a bit um, of the welcome message. You could look at the about a section again, all managed and created by uh, the language experts themselves. Uh, you have a few options in terms of navigating this. You could go learn about the language itself. You could play a game, uh, go to the photo gallery or go to the kids portal. Uh, there are also a few links to external websites, so uh, the HealthSec Nation website, uh, the language website in this example, and communities will put different things here. Uh, what we'll do is jump into the language, but I, again, I encourage you to go in, and um, navigate around. In the language section, you'll see um, words, you'll see phrases, songs, stories, and alphabet. Um, if you want to type in the language, you'll usually also have a link to the keyboard here on the side. Um, yeah, and all of these are uh, community curated information. So a good kind of start would be to go uh, to the alphabet page and kind of familiarize yourself with the sounds. So if you click on this, it may not be playing for you, but it will play for you if you go to the site. So there are various different sounds um, that don't always map to the sounds we have in English that you could kind of listen to to, to familiarize yourself. Um, you could also go and access um, the actual dictionary, which is where most of the content is. So in this view, we have the content that has um, like the dictionary items. Uh, we, we can browse by alphabet on the side. We can browse by categories, so I could go and find all the animal um, categories. For example, here I could listen to the audio for them. 
and also uh, click in for more details. So very cool stuff um, for each of these entries. Um, it's also extremely important to acknowledge the speakers, um, especially for when um, community members navigate it, because it will give them an idea of like, maybe it's a relative of theirs or, or maybe it's someone they know or they pronounce things in a specific way. But if you click on this I icon, you'll be able to see that. So it's a very audio, it's a site that is very audio driven, obviously. Um, our search function, we could probably talk about quite a bit, but I'll say that it's extremely um, optimized to handle mistakes because sometimes you won't have the right keyboard or sometimes you're typing in something that's kind of close, but not quite. So you can actually search in both English and the language. So in this example, I'll search for this word here. So you'll notice if I type it like this without the right I, it still shows up. And if I type it exactly, it will give me some, it will give me the result, but also other close results. So search is like an extremely uh, useful tool here. So if I want to search in English, I could search for hello and then um, listen to the pronunciation here. Um, same goes for our phrases. So similar idea here. Um, some sites will have actual phrase books. We can go and look at one that has phrase books. Um, but this is also a great place to kind of search, browse, like listen to the language. Um, yeah, we'll jump around to a different site just to see a different example. So Kwa Kwa Kwala. Um, navigating into words. If I want to know how to say welcome, I could search for that in this specific site. And there's Gela Kesla, which is welcome, but also thank you. It's also important to realize that like um, things don't always map to English. So like the teams will try the best they can to like put the definition as English, but sometimes something is a greeting. So it doesn't you kind of have to listen to it and read a little bit about it and learn how to use it um, in context. Uh, one additional feature I want to show you is um, songs and stories. So in addition to the dictionary data, um, communities will upload uh, songs and stories as well, which is great for kids and for adult learners. Uh, so we'll go and look at one example here. So Homalco um, has a number of um, songs and stories that they've uploaded uh, to their site. So for example, a lot of times we encourage people to include audio, obviously. So this really cute, what color is it? Is it story? So you could go to the story and then open the book kind of move through it and learn. It's a really great way to learn some basic terms. And here what they did is take some photos also from uh, children in their community and have them kind of be the presenters of this um, rich content. Um, yeah, another feature I can show. What we're looking at, by the way, now is a non logged in view. Um, like communities will have a totally se separate view where they edit and add content, but um, that's kind of something for a bigger <laughs> presentation that's not necessarily relevant. So, right now, what you're seeing is what communities have decided to share um, with the broader public. Uh, another cool feature we have is the gallery feature. Some communities and sites will have this where you could go again, go to the site, the specific site for Slyamin, um, for example. Um, and you could go into the photo gallery and see um, some of the things that have been uploaded, like some 
modern photos of the Tlaiamen life um, or more historic photos. And kind of the last feature I wanted to show, which we're really happy about, really proud of, and we'll have like a bit more uh, to share about is the, the immersion feature. Uh, so we, we live in a very English slash Latin centered world. And what we're trying to do more and more with our sites, especially for our indigenous users are, is immerse them in their language, which is extremely important for when you're trying to revitalize a language and learn, learn more. Um, so some of our sites actually have this, the ability to um, go down uh, here and click this immerse in Lilwat option. And you'll notice that what that does is actually change the English labels on the site to labels in the language. So instead of saying welcome guest, it says welcome in the language. And I can actually turn on kind of this immersion helper and click through and see what each of these mean. And this is really great for, again, for the indigenous users of the platform to just have a space that's, like Hannah was saying, um, safe, accessible, and meaningful uh, for them to explore. Yeah, so that's a brief introduction of the web uh, platform. Um, again, I encourage you to go uh, check it out. If you have any ideas and suggestions, you could always contact us uh, at support at, at FPCC or hello at firstvoices.com. Um, and I'll just briefly uh, talk a bit about the other things we do, and then we'll have some time for questions. So we've browsed the website. In addition to the website, um, you'll find uh, that we have mobile apps and keyboards. Uh, there's lots and lots about keyboards on our knowledge base. Um, so again, there's a link on firstvoices.com if you, if you want to learn about that. Um, keyboards are an extremely important part of the work we do because they actually allow communities to type in their language. It's like a key to, to a lot of work um, for First Voices and also outside of First Voices. Um, also, if you want to, if you have a QR code reader and you want to um, quickly go and see this page, you can uh, scan that now and you'll get a chance to see the various apps. Uh, it's great also if you're working and living in a certain territory and that's the one language that you're interested in learning. Um, as I've mentioned, keyboards um, is another great uh, kind of resource. We have them for um, mobile devices. We have them for computers as well. Uh, so you have an opportunity also to scan this one if you want to have access to the keyboards or it's on our site as well. 